Jenks, welcome back. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. Nice right. to be back. As always. I was trying to think, like, it doesn't seem like it's that long, but I guess it was late May, early June anyway. And here we are basically on the eve of September. So it's still it's been a few months. Weird, to be yeah. honest with you. Everyone's telling me that time is not operating in so any sort of linear fashion and it's kind of speeded up. And people yeah. say, oh, you're just old. But young people are telling me this as well. Oh, totally, totally. It's, it's, I think it's one of the phenomenological evidences for a great transition that we're going through, right? So, I, yeah, I agree with that completely. I also think no one, because no one did anything for like two years there, <laughs> it's like, what fucking year is it? When did I do that, right? Was that 2019? How long ago was that, last year? And you go, no, as a matter of fact, <laughs> it was three years ago now. And that's the other part that's sort of messed with that phenomenological experience of time. I, that's my take, my two cents on it anyway. It's, it's just bizarre. I mean, you know, I've written a book in six months or finished a book in six months, which is phenomenally quick. I've done two, actually, you know, including yeah. an actual title. And, well, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, that's one of the ones we're talking about. Uh, the the recently released or is it available yet? Like we're, we're live streaming this. Can people get the um, Thai occult to? No, it's going to come out uh, basically as soon as I know when you're releasing this. It'll come out. All right, cool. All right. So for the people, for the twenty five people watching live at the moment, you can't get it yet. But for everyone else, <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Nice one. All right. Well, let's. I mean, let's talk about the book. And I, I obviously just um, finished the PDF. But I have been. Um, I think even the the dangerous, forbidden, we shall not mention its name book that had to be pulped. I think I've been there the whole way. And um, so it's really one. Your photography has improved dramatically um, over the course of that journey. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. It's called a better camera. I could tell. <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, look at that depth of field, you know. Um, the other thing that I noticed is I think the interviewing has got better and, and the sort of your experience of, which is very evident in this book, the, mm. the sort of geo the geography, I suppose, of time magic um, being... I think for me anyway, it was a lot clearer to go, oh, okay, so this stuff is from here because it's near the Burmese border and and like that kind of stuff. Absolutely very clear for me um, this time. But I think some of the definitions are tighter now too. So, and I think I want to start there with the book, like not what's the definition of Thai magic, but what would be a Thai definition of magic? Wow. Um, often something to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the current indoctrination regarding Buddhism and um, uh, regarding the practice of all things of this type, but that is also about to change. It is so deep within the culture, I think the explanation to Thai people is just, it is culture. Mm. It is it is them. Yeah, And as soon as, you know, like we've had conversations with people where um, you know, they're modern, they're, you know, everything, they have everything in their lives that anybody has anywhere in the world. And yet, as soon as things just shift a little bit, then they go back into the culture, into their own deep culture to fix the daily problems of life or to fix the things that are coming you know, yeah. to realign our relationship to the world so it is beneficial. It, well, it's, the guys use it as nudges, you know, okay. they use it as almost, yeah, it's like it's like having a buffet, you know, oh, I fancy a little bit of that, or, you know, they, it's, it's something we don't really understand in that respect. Well, no, right, because here's the thing, like, a, a decent sort of, let's say, Western definition of magic would be trafficking with spirits, just <laughs> as a shorthand, right? But if if it's normal to... Um, placate play spirits before, for instance, building a house like you just did. Is that even magic? Do you know what I mean? Or is that just it's like, I just say, exactly, right? Like, so magic is probably when you get into like Pry Town, when you're in there doing stuff with like gooey dead bits and graveyards and so on, that probably is still magic, right? But yeah. 
but I, it's the Thai definition of magic is going to be different because so much of the things that we consider magic, they just consider life, <laughs> you know. One that there was a, a great example of this was one time we had a um, quite a famous magician over, a very very potent witch, and we were on our way to see a dancer. And um, <clears throat> this lad said to Bon, so, do you practice magic? And it was kind of said in like, you know, a pushy kind of way. And Bon just said, my culture is magic. <laughs> the language is magic yeah. as well. It's just been used in that manner for thousands of years. And, you know, it never ceases to amaze me where I'll ask Ajana or any Ajana about how old is that magic? And uh, they might say, oh, it's pre-Buddhist. Yeah. You know, well, that's just like, that's a, automatically, in Thailand, it arrived about 2,000 years ago-ish. So it's automatically over 2,000 years old. And it's just, I think their relationship to magic is different to ours. I think they understand it in a different way. But I will actually test your question on many people over this next six months. No, and it's good say because it's, it's a really good point because you know it's like a lot of things people write to me about you know, it's like i can't encompass that i can't express that i can't uh, you might have actually seen in this latest book the choice of words is different the, the mm -hmm. directness is different as well and it just comes from knowing the subject better and also yeah. having eyes in my chart so watch your step <laughs> <laughs> that definitely comes through like the the um the domain expertise comes through and the sort of clarity understanding of the completeness of landscape and so on i also mm. quite like because why i specifically ask that as a definition of magic rather than say the occult because of course the book is and the, the kind of let's call it a brand um is the thai occult mm. uh and that that is more well obviously the word occult means hidden but it, but more it's more specifically um, in this case, it's it's the practices that are done kind of like on the other side of some kind of barrier, where that's, whether that's initiation, training, um, being a monk, or what have you. So the Thai, I think when we get to the word occult, I think they have a more robust and better version of the same. Because in the West, it's been ruined completely now. It's well, like Dresden. Like, the word it. occult is just like people use it on TikTok. And uh, <laughs> it's done <laughs> right that's where, it's, that's where it's, everything good goes to die yeah how to translate sayasat into thai, into english yeah because the yeah. word sayasat itself in thai is like it denotes a system it de denotes generally playing with forces that are not necessarily of this world yeah, yeah. putakun is the magic of the buddha yeah, Putakun, that's reasonably easy to translate. It's Buddhist magic. There's no playing with, you know, land spirits or dead people or um, tree spirits or anything like that. It is just the use of herbs and blessings. But then again, people regard that as the occult. They regard all magic as the occult in some of the more right-wing Buddhist circles. Yeah, sure. One of the things I thought was interesting in the, I forget who wrote the introduction, but just kind of noticing how the Thai occult has changed over time, um, mm -hmm. like over his lifetime, where the it, his understanding as a young person of what, say, Thai magic or the Thai occult was, was protection from snake bites and dogs. Uh, and and now it's more about like uh, wealth magic and love magic. And, and yet in, in him describing, who was that who said, a jam and thing, a jam thing. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I like that, and also sort of thinking about wealth and love magic as a kind of new form, almost of protection magic. But just like that, life has changed. Where your principal concerns at the beginning of his life were like when you're out there laboring in a field, don't get bitten by a snake. And now yeah. it's um, who gets the promotion for that job in Bangkok or whatever, That's right? Now it's changing yeah. again. It's gonna. It's about they've they've rooting to the back of the cupboard, and which is why some of the astonishing old prize coming out that I'm snapping up as fast as I can, um, and it's turning towards protection magic, and now also things like stealing magic. Okay. Um, 
whereby you can steal good fortune from people you don't like. And there's lots of kind of, you know, we're going to do an amulet to a black werewolf because that's in the title cult as well. It's a not a very, it's a pretty rare uh, witcher, but it's about having, you know, the Hoompion you might remember as a, an amulet type. There is also, I now also find out there is a dog pion, which is a black okay. dog, like a werewolf. And it, when you're home, it guards the home like having a very ferocious dog. You know, so I mean, we're, I always feel like we're just kind of scratching the surface, to be honest with you, especially yeah. with some of the more complicated regions. I mean, you know, the write up about central time magic, it's really glib. We need to perhaps try and interview one of the Brahmin priests regarding central magic because it's just, it's glib. You know, there's a lot more work to do on this, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned Witcher. What's uh, what's a Witcher for people who... Um, uh, Witcher is the same root as the word Wiccan. It's uh, from the Sanskrit root and it, it just means knowledge. Yeah, it means teaching knowledge. That's it. You can have a witcher for mathematics, a witcher for physics, and you can have a witcher for magic. It's just explaining explaining the knowledge. Yeah, cool. So let's um, let's do a geographic overview because I I found I mean I know it's sort of been mentioned in the other books, but for whatever reason it was clearer to me in in this book and and I, and the sort of general understanding of it. Um, so like we talk about. The Thai occult or Thai magic, um, and it's sort of like saying European magic or South American magic. It's kind of like there are mm. things you can say at that level, but there is a lot more you can learn when you understand that that's not an especially useful geographic category, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's um, it turns. I mean, to be honest with you, magic varies varies here between the towns. You know, uh, between uh, each different uh, tribe that lives here, and like all, you know, Southeast Asian countries, there are various tribes coming in, and it's really an attempt is this to try to try and differentiate between the magic types, which but the style of questioning for that has changed completely from the last Tao cult book from the first one. Whereby, if you look at the one, the interview with Ajahn Sir about Lana magic, now the original 500 and odd page book was really about 90% Lana magic, Northern Thai magic. And I interviewed him about Lana magic and we described it in 30 pages, including photographs. You know, that's yeah. phenomenally difficult for somebody who lives within the magic itself. And it was just by changing the view, we needed to change the view of what it is to get a better understanding of what's in this region. So we can start uh, perhaps picking at various forms of magic and working with the people in those books to produce something that can be of help to the world. And that's what it's about. That's what I've been working on for, you know, two years. Yeah. Um, I want to find that. I actually want to find the Lana magic stuff. How... What are we at? Like, what do you reckon the page number is? <laughs> um, it's not like, you just keep going. It's about another 10 pages, I reckon. Yeah, this, no, no, is, the we this is the but central I'm... stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, this, this is the is... stuff that needs more work around it, you were saying, just in terms of talking to a Brahmin priest? Uh, no, that's the central tie. That's right. the, that's what we're doing. That's the interview with Ajahn Apichai. Yeah. I think it's, it needs more work because I think it's way more, this is the ceremonial magic. You know, we've kind of just glossed over it because the Jan is a practical occultist, really. He works and he makes money out of doing occult, the um, occult practices. He's not a Brahmin priest. And I think we really need an, a full interview from an astrologer, a top astrologer. Because, again, that's different from somebody who's psychic, who has a pretty decent understanding. It's not the same. Yeah. So this is why this book isn't, I don't think it's going to end for quite some time. So anybody who buys it will receive updates on this book. Because oh, cool. I, can't, I can't construct it. And you know, it's already cost $3,000. And I can't keep constructing it and go $10,000 out of pocket. 
um, because it's going to take years. And there's some makers we need to follow in this book to truly understand what they know, because they have, I mean, there's such complicated magic with some of them. It's incredible. I never thought I would find the stuff in this book. It's, I'm, yeah, uh, it's, I want to talk about the incense, like the, the sort of, uh, I don't want to say practical implications necessarily, but some of the uh, learnings from how Thai magic does actual practical enchantment. Um, mm. That's towards the end of the book, like the, the numbers of different joss sticks um, for different either spirit targets or goals or what have you. I really like. I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna use some of them and see what happens <laughs> because that's, I think it's yeah, that's what it's there for. This yeah. is what this is what they are telling us. Because they receive merit for this work. Oh, good. You know, okay. They are they are trying to help people. Some of the Ajans who really understand what's coming, and the Ajans I work closely to do understand what's coming or have an idea of it. Um, Ajan do is great. He just says, it's going to be shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's his summation of the next 10 years. He said, but, you know, we still have to help people. And we still have to make merit from helping people. Yep. That's a good attitude. And that's that timing is exactly right. The next 10 years are gonna be shit. <laughs> that's in my that's in my model too. We there's a really cool picture of some amulets, some like uh yeah, really cool picture of amulets. So should we start with because I want to talk about candle magic. Uh, I want to talk about, let's do it this way. I want to talk about categories that are um, comparable, which means we lose something when I say candle magic and doll magic, for instance. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a good way to start doing the comparison. But we, we've got amulets up here, shall we? Shall we? Um, one of the things I learned in this book, which I really, really liked, um, because it reminds me, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, so in Lana Magic, I think it's this guy was talking about how when he's cre no, a John Su Suya, yeah. This where is he? This uh, one. Hi, his name yeah, yeah. In well, I was talking about praising the ancestors of the lineage in particular when making an amulet, and that again is something that's a real Peruvian thing as well, um, because I do similar stuff in, in it's my It's worldwide, and we yeah. basically got too enamored by using bone and chunks of body in the first book to really push it forward, and that is pushed forward in pretty much every single section of the book, and particularly in the last section of the book. Yeah, no, absolutely. So talk us through, because I have actually, because I know I have a uh, Baphomet amulet um, that... It's so a lovely gift that came through. I'll show people. I'm going to show people for a reason. It's obviously one. Uh, well, one. I, I think we should send you the the top one then, because that that was the ordinary edition. Oh, was uh, it? There well, is I'm, another. I'm just going to throw it out. That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need, I think we should send. I'll send you um, one of the on crew, Gordon. I'll get your address. Later. Oh, that would be good. That would. And and next time, I'll, I'm willing to sample them on premier. So. Um, all right. Why I thought this was so. Everyone, I want, to, I want you to look at that again. Those are the pieces mm -hmm. that are in it, and this is a prosperity amulet I got at the witch's market in Lima. And again, well, it's it's. Um, this is you can tell it's got sort of you can sort of see the green part in it is money, right? Yeah. Um, but the logic of it is basically like the same, right? When I when um I was given this in Mexico by a mutual friend Carlos, and. I held it and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely Baphomet because I did this sort of eight or nine day, forget how long it was now, like fasting, hellfire caves, ending in magic mushrooms, Baphomet thing about 10 years ago, I guess now. Um, and I'm like, well, first of all, it's definitely Baphomet. But then I was looking at the piece components going like, what does this remind me of? And I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> my Peruvian amulets. And it, at, like at the level of materiality, the level of material culture, mm. it's, it looks very similar. Well, this again, I get a lot of um, over the years, over the past few years, I've had a lot of emails from people saying, How would the Ajans do this? What would they think about this? And if these are people who are making their own amulets, yeah. you know, recently I had a lovely chat with somebody who's made a fantastic job of carving amulets from ivory and various stone 
And you know, it's a job. He's done it so well. Any any magician would be pleased with it. And he said that came from looking at what the ties do, because that was the whole idea from the first book, which is why your support came as well. If I remember correctly, Gordon, you know, um, because they can influence the world, because it's not stopped here. No. And there's the. Um... This is the thing I've been long interested in, and it's in my most recent book. It's this kind of Tyson Yonkerpotter's difference between products of thought and ways of thinking. And if you try to take Thai products of thought, you're effectively appropriating. And not in the sense of purchasing an amulet, but in the sense of like, oh, the Thai do things this way, so I'll do them that way. It's like, no, no, no. Drop down to the next level of why they do them that way. Like, like find the Thai logic right? And that's more universal. And again, you see that in between like Peruvian amulets and, and Thai amulets. But like this book, I think is very good at describing the logic as to how and why the different steps for candle magic are done, and the different steps for doll magic. So you might not have the human blood available to to um, <laughs> feed the ghosts that are going no, into the white doll. Yeah. <laughs> but like, <laughs> you understand the logic and go, okay, cool. So what I need to do is feed those spirits and you literally may not have human blood, but that's not necessarily the point. The point is like, this is how wax dolls <laughs> are made in, in, in um, Thailand. And so that's the kind of learning or logic that can um, be deployed in your own kind of enchantments in whatever system you happen to be in. I mean, generally the answer to these things is uh, think less and feel more. And in that way, you'll find the right answer. You know, yeah. um, you know. In the last section, we discuss a lot about instincts and a lot about getting to the position where we can make decisions correctly. Um, and this is always the interesting thing about correspondence with people. It always starts off as thinking as much as they yeah. can, uh, <laughs> and then ends up being a much calmer use of language just after two or three emails. Yeah. You know, you can just from the words chosen between each, or from usually from me to them, because I'm more used to it, I live here, um, actually automatically brings them down to actually to knowing their the answers themselves because they've just stopped trying to force it, you know, and, they, and they're feeling it. Yeah. This, um, yeah, speaking of, we'll get to in a minute, but this is a good example of what well, I'm looking through the book going like, no, nah, Jenks' photography has, has improved. This is very Instagram. This is very like not that you know, be cooking enough. on Instagram. <laughs> 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 All right, so I want to talk about like, so what's yeah, right? Yeah, is it's it, a herbal mixture. A yeah, yeah is like a medicine or a herbal mixture. Because that was one of the things I thought was interesting. There's a, there's a word that sort of, there's a couple of them that are used in the book. I forget the other one. It's like Thai, yeah, or something that also mm -hmm. translates as like medicine or curing. And, that's it. and yeah, yeah. And again, that's another one of those universals, right? Curanderismo, um, Spanish word coming from curing. Um, and whilst cunning comes from cani, it's that same idea of like a, a curing person uh, or does someone have the cunning or is someone cunny? Is, is, is this idea of, curing as a as an act and also an energy and I thought, again it's one of these if it's here in thailand and it's there in like cunning traditions and it's like there in peru for me the guy who wrote starships and like this is old this is a thirty thousand year old idea so old that it's actually been able to um develop its own flavor in different parts of the world i mean the classic example here is between uh thai occultism and uh the ATRs, African traditional religions. You know, they've never, ever, they have never, ever come into contact with each other. And yet they are supportive of each other's ideas completely, 100%. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really quite beautiful, actually. And this is, this is the human blood on dolls that I was referring to earlier, if you're watching the video <laughs> on YouTube. Right. All right, let's do doll magic. Let's, um, you can't actually dig in this um, in that graveyard anymore without coming across the chances. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a, when I was looking at the picture with the, the paving behind, I'm like, is he in a park? Like, it has to be a graveyard. But, yeah. 
and his favorite one is one where he knows the ghosts very well and he has a few very friendly ones that work well for him so he's quite big this is very hipster and he's got the sleeve tats to to go with it right um he's quite and i think this is correct and it comes back to another universal in a perfect world the wax from things like four things like candles and dolls is harvested specifically from different areas depending on the goal right yeah and basically there are supernatural as there are supernatural woods there's supernatural ways for a tree to die yeah. there's supernatural ways to create there's ways to create a supernatural body remains there are also supernatural uh, waxes uh, Adan used to go out when he was able, he had a massive brain hemorrhage about eight years ago, ten years ago. So he can't go walking in the wilds anymore. But when he was a monk, he used to go off walking in the mountains and would often find like a bee's hive that has got so big it's connected to the floor. And that was what, you know, one of the best forms of uh, wax supernatural wax to be available nowadays people just it's, it's gone a lot mm. of times you know there was a bee that lived in the ground that used that was a brilliant form of wax for pride candles so what they do now like a jan uh, do it he compensates for that only by using pure beeswax anyway but he will compensate for that by actually writing all the spells by hand instead mm. of having printed spell and adding a ya see we're back to ya already adding a ya to it uh, which he generally uses one called a ya chintamani which is a legend in asia about uh, green stones that bring enormous fortune and things like that uh, just to add a little bit of extra oomph to things so when something like <clears throat> like candle wax loses its relevance because it just becomes so rare, they balance it by adding somebody else to keep up the potency of the magic. There's a um, Vedic story that I use at the beginning of Starships um, where there's this old Indian guy using a knife and someone asks him how old the knife is and he's like, oh, it's five, 600 years old, it's very old. Like the blade has been replaced a few times and the handle's been replaced a few times, but it's still the same knife. And, mm. and this is sort of the same idea of if you follow the logic, it's like, right, so for a whole bunch of reasons to do with urbanization and the environment and the rest of it, and the fact that we don't really use candles so much anymore, there's less of a beeswax industry, but also less of that kind of uh, uh, abundant availability in the wild. So what is the logic? What is the, like, how do we bring extra potency to it? And handwriting spells is one of them. the other thing i was thinking because we're getting bees this season here which is literally now because it's spring is mm -hmm. um they they need to find some graveyards that they can keep hives in yes um, and that would and, and that would be like again modern um uh, a modern idea emerging out of that ancient logic right if they, can, if they can get themselves if I can get myself <laughs> some of my hives in one of the nearby graveyards, like sweet, you know. Yeah. So if you just do, if you do that, if anybody does that, all it would need would be one mention of it online, then you would have enough people to sell the wax to. Totally, totally. But there are also there would also be other ways, like enchanted areas of forests or caves, in particular. And the mouths of caves would be a very good place. Yeah. Um, for uh, keeping bees and getting the correct and getting potent um, uh, wax. Uh, candle wax has to be beeswax in general. That's the lowest kind of level. It's got to come directly from nature. Um, but I mean, that's a great idea. I'll pass it on. Because <laughs> oh, cool. I'd love that. I don't do it. Fucking hell. I don't do his graveyard. It is the maddest graveyard ever. Um, and if he wants, if he wants tips on um, hive designs that are more beneficial for the bees, I'm a permaculture designer. I have all the boring bee knowledge. <laughs> he, would, I mean, he would probably get somebody else to do it, and then paying yeah, for good. the wax. But I mean, yeah. um, God knows what that what it would be like growing it in that graveyard. I'm not sure you'd be able to eat the honey. 
to be honest. No, but that. like honey itself is an extremely potent magical um, substance, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, it would be a cry honey to be honest. Yeah, it would. There you go. Yeah. So um, for goth yeah, breakfast. I mentioned that to a John. He might like that idea. He'd probably be eating the prior honey because he loves that graveyard. But every time I go, I, <laughs> there's always something really weird happens. And it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, this time, he said, um, last time we went, he said, oh, let's go on the motorbike instead of the car. It's easier. So he jumped on the back of the bike and did everything he needed to do with a curse. And then on the way out, there's a three and a half meter python crossing the road. So he sat there saying Qatar like you would in the wild many, many hundreds of years ago. You would say Qatar, there's Qatar to not back a tag or a Qatar to make sure the snake doesn't bite you as well when you see it. You know, while this thing lumbers across the road, you know, <laughs> your deer is scraping. It? it was a big snake. And that's all. Always... In that so. Place. It sounds, it's, it's two things though, like it sounds really exotic um, and exciting and, and, and magical that, that, that graveyards are these wild, exciting places, right? But there's another side to it, which I think is very appealing, which is it's an indication that death remains like non-taboo and actually part of culture. Like, so graveyards are used in the way that we actually, Catholics anyway, only stopped really doing this in like the seventies, but we don't use graveyards anymore and it's a, it's a and i don't mean put them to use but they're not incorporated into our lives we won't do like um old hallows picnics or any of that kind of stuff which is sort of like a french catholic thing or at least it was um up until around the mid 20th century right uh we don't do that anymore but it, like they're not only used for the fact that they're used for this kind of stuff and exciting things is going on i think is an indication of a healthier attitude to death in general, right? Well, it's Buddhist. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> they are ex extremely used to the process and cycle, and they, they don't mind. Um, one of Ajahn Dewey's teachers, um, Ponan Chalo, and he's uh, currently dying of throat cancer. And not just nothing bothers him whatsoever. He's just. Yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. It's just it's just the process, and when he passes, a dam will have a conduit to him in his uh, sandmac, his place of work, and uh, we'll probably see him every now and again when he makes an appearance, and that's it. You know, he just becomes an ancestor. He becomes lineage magic, and he carries yeah. on his role in the afterworld. You know, it's remarkable. I like it. Um, speaking of, I think it was Ajahn Krit who spent a month living in a graveyard to sort of, uh, like, I think that's amazing. I think that another one of the things I learned from this book is, like, that would be very powerful to, to be able to do yeah. that. Uh, Lucy Masia did that as well. He lived in the graveyard for a while. And a really old favourite of mine, uh, Ajahn, um, uh, what's his name? He, he lived eight years in a graveyard. Ajahn Dewey wants to move to his graveyard, but they won't let him build the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, it, I got the impression that this was more like camping in a graveyard. And so obviously the first question in, that people ask about camping trips like that is not, because the, he had food and stuff brought to him, but it's like, where do you go to the bathroom, right? Or is it, is it oh, like a civic graveyard? But like, I was going to say, like, is it a civic graveyard where there's actual public toilets and things? Because if so... Yeah, you can totally spend a month in a climate like that. You can totally spend a month in a graveyard. Yeah, easily. You know, I mean, um, monks still go to graveyards in the north and they will often travel there in a group of nine to give merit to the dead and perform a ceremony. Monks, I've seen monks meditating in graveyards still to this day because it's the best way to remove fear and not be disturbed by the spirits and just have equanimity towards the living and the dead. You know, it's incredibly beneficial as an action. You know, I mean, Ajahn Sir, as I mentioned on a couple of occasions, he'd like me to spend a night in, the, in his graveyard. But I mean, it's just full of mosquitoes and it's gonna to have to be very cold to keep the mozzies down because they would, you just get eaten. Right. You know, these places are wild. They are pre-society. 
this is not a graveyard that's part of a temple. These graveyards were the first places that they burned people in the region. You know, thousands you get like a rig up a mosquito net on the ground or something, surely. Well, not while sat in the cremation pit, which is where the no, normal. Yeah. You know, There's I mean, also I find it very amusing me trying to make it kind of hermetically sealed against. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're just going to have to get eaten. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, unless it's on a very cold night. It does get pretty cold in the evenings up here. In yeah, the winter, yeah, good. On a few days. You know, get to six degrees C or below. All right, yeah, no mosquitoes then. That's all right. It keeps them down, and it'll get to that sometimes. Oh, cool. Uh, so, yeah, one day. One day, because it wouldn't really bother me. You're allowed a candle, and then, but then when that burns out, that's it. You know, so you might have <laughs> Bring one of those big church candles. <laughs> <laughs> You day. Yeah. <laughs> said one candle. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I've been there in the dark on my own already many a time, and it's yeah, it's they're all wandering about, but you know, whatever. Yeah, as long as they keep it down, get some sleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you are meant to sleep there as well to also cope with them coming to your dreams. Exactly. I think that again, the logic of that is very sound to me. I think that's a really good way of doing it. Um, we did the wax. Let's just jumping back to again. I call it doll magic, but that's only for comparison, right? So mm -hmm. here's a good picture of one of them. And so talk us through some of the logic of what these are used for. Um, well, dolls are used on many occasions, often as in here for a binding. Um, and there will be in a John Sears case. They often use it to crook with the person's birthday details and birth date and name. Um, Ajahn Apichai sometimes uses that, sometimes not. He sometimes adds a little prior so he can put their names and uh, picture in each doll using his psyche. So there's generally two ways of doing it. And it's binding magic. Either, you know, usually people just take that as being for love, but it's not only for that. You can bind yourself to your boss. If you're scared of losing your job or you want favoritism, you can bind yourself to anybody within society as long as you have the details in the photograph. Yeah, cool. And I presume, because going back here, I can That's they're mostly that. red? Um, red and uh, Ajahn normally uses red and black wax for that. Mm. Uh, Ajahn, sir. Ajahn Apichai uses the same colour wax because he wants them to be bound in the same way. But this is Ajahn, sir, using the same colour wax as well. It yeah. probably just depends on what he's got in the cupboard, to be honest with you. Yeah. But I think he likes to use two different coloured waxes for the two sexes. That might be for a gay couple. Right. But um, Ajahn Apichai... You more likely to use both of the same color because it's more of a resonance, or would it depend? I don't think it has a relevance to Ajahn yeah. in that respect. I think it really, whatever he just needs the shape to embody it yeah. and use 32 parts of the body magic to put that person's image and spirit, a version of their spirit within it, using their birthday. That's right. That was the other thing. So it's, you put the name and the birthday inside the wax, right? Again, another, you, you find similar ideas in the Greek magical papyri. It's another one of those fantastic yep. universals, right? Yeah. Yep. And thousands of, the Humpayon is pre Buddhist. It's thousands of years old. They're still using the spell. And there's, it's such a good spell, they're still developing it. And there are hundreds of variation to this spell. Mm -hmm. Ajahn Abhikai uses it. An incredible amount of times to play. It's actually, yeah, that's actually a really lovely way of thinking about doll magic. In in this case, like having mm -hmm. a a a human shaped receptacle for a piece of paper that has identifying details on it. Right, it's a really lovely way of thinking about it. That it's actually the one spell that's ten thousand years old if it's a day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that everyone's, because it's so powerful, everyone's still working you, on it. There's something almost like, almost Discworld about it. There's like a Terry Pratchettness to it, where it's like, this is one big spell that magicians across the world have been working on. And 
improving and tinkering with for millennia. It, and it continues to this day. It's, yeah. uh, Ajahn Abhichat is brilliant at the Humpayon spell. And he can do, he uses it in all sorts of ways. He uses it in all forms, in many forms of magic. And in amulets, you would not expect it to be there. I think it's very closely, I've not been told this, but it appears to be very closely related to the 32 parts of body magic itself. Okay. So, uh, and if, if when they use their psyche, their jit, they can put anything, any create anybody within something. I guarantee you part of that spell is within that Baphomet. Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a very, very odd spell, or one of the techniques of creating that. Uh, they've never said that, but when they invite things into something, I think there's an aspect of uh, Humpayon magic in there as well. Very cool. All right. Um, I'll, I'm... I think that's where I want to leave the dull magic section, this idea that it's one big spell, mm. one big old spell that people are improving on. I think that, that that appeals to me. Um, I, it's I'll a probably... lot of, you know, in the same respect that when I went to see Ajahn Sura for an overview in a different way of thinking to uh, about Lana magic, you're doing the same thing towards the world. So these are just steps out of, a region and into the wider world, which is really appreciated because I mean, because that <clears throat> I didn't know you'd do this, and that's but that's exactly what I have done. Mm. So it's only one more step, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. All right. So um, candle magic. One of the things that I thought it's, it's it, <laughs> this is a very Thai categorization, I suppose. This is maybe not necessarily universal, but you write that like there's two categories. Candles with pry and candles without pry. <laughs> and that, so that's like the, the top level category for candle magic. And then underneath that would be, um, you know, uh, pry love spells, pry cursing, pry binding, non pry, and what have you. So that's, it's, that's very Thai, right? Like that the, the, the sort of top way of thinking about it categorically is pry or non pry. That's because some people can use pry and some people can't. Hmm. So they need to offer both. Um, it's just, and it's a very similar spell. It's just that the pry is a <coughs> is a baseball bat. Yeah, as far with as nails in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do we get? Do we have a definition of pry for this episode? In case people are new, uh, supernatural human materials. Yeah. But also it now turns out, I mean, when I say supernatural, human materials that have been made supernatural through early death, generally, and the more violent, the better, because the more sudden it is, the more power comes from those remains. Drownings are particularly good because of the, uh, you know, the struggle. And being killed by nature is the, by far the best. And drowning can be included in that. But a lightning strike is phenomenally potent and has its own particular feeling as well because you are killed by nature itself in an instant. Um, <clears throat> and generally it keeps its power for what would have been the natural lifespan of the person. But because then the ghost moves on. But... <clears throat> um, after that, it can still have power as an angel, as an angelic. Yeah. And um, also, now we're discovering that nature has pry, so you have pry woods. It's just another way of considering it. Um, and pry animals, you can have animal pry as well. If we uh, go that far, you know, tigers. So, things. like natural pry, one of the things. This is another universal and a weird personal one. Um, would be, I guess, lightning struck wood might be an example, right? Because the, um, we, a couple of years ago, it's in Animistic, so it's a few years ago now, um, we had an, an historic fire in Tasmania that almost destroyed the farm, got within 200 meters of it. And the lightning strike for it that lit the first tree kind of in our area um, hit, hit this large tree outside of town. And my friend who lives up the hill from me, she's a candomblé initiate as well, so another magic type. And we, we were trying to get access to it. Once the, you know, um, the disaster had ended, we were trying to get access to this, this tree um, that had been struck by lightning where the fire 
basically almost destroyed our town and destroyed, you know, tens of thousands of hectares of um, na nature. But it's surrounded by, because it's sort of on a bit of unused kind of like farmland and it's surrounded by, by blackberry bush. And mm -hmm. fire season is also black tiger snake season. And where they live in abundance is in blackberry bush. And, and in Tasmania, like a blackberry bush is 20% black snake <laughs> at that time of year so it was really fun we're sort of like standing on the road looking at like is there any way we and she was like gonna pay locals to try and do it and none of them <laughs> none of them were stupid enough to do it so eventually the council knocked the tree down and we didn't get access to it but it was this hilarious moment of going like that's really good magic <laughs> that tree oh. and we couldn't get to it because we were you know Blackberry bushes are unpleasant to climb through at the best of times. And when they're filled with deadly snakes. It's not know. a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I leaf out of Juan Paupina's book, um, who's my spiritual hero. We've discussed him before. Uh, on the hill behind Watson on Lau, he put up a metal post. And that hill's always been struck by lightning. And underneath that metal post, he put tiny balls of metal. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not too sure whether it was from a melted statue or just balls of metal. And um, it just keep adding to these balls, you know. Every time he had a chance to get some, he'd go up the hill and carry a load and take them. And then when it, the lightning struck, they became one of the features of his work. And it would strike there every two or three years on average. And there was, he would have balls of metal charged by lightning. Yeah, that's clever. It's magic farming, I like it. Yeah. And it made a huge difference to his work because he had he could put the magic of the heavens and of nature itself within each talisman. Yeah, I like that. That's clever. Um so candle magic, other than pry, non pry, is there any and again we'll say what general things can we say about time magic with the obvious caveat <laughs> that you lose you lose something when you uh, when we speak generally right um, well I think with candle magic I learn about it all the time because people ask for candle magic uh, Adam Dewey is absolutely brilliant at it because he does it in the super uh, traditional way and if you look where he's doing that on the left that's the yeah, gentlemanly that he puts inside, he sprinkles it all the way along the spell. The spell is completely oh, yeah. by hand. Yeah, uh, and that particular candle was for a gentleman, a friend who often visits, Mr. Eric. Uh, lovely guy, loves a bit of pain. Um, and uh, he'd had a, I, I'm sure he doesn't mind my saying, but he'd had a medical problem, and we were just kind of ensuring that he was all going to get through a an operation and he did it was a success all the rest of it and that is what candle magic is best used for people don't really understand candle magic yes now i don't understand it to be honest i'm learning about it all the time it's vast so if there's any problem that is <clears throat> being part of humanity and society for a very long time there'll be a candle for it and it's instant magic. It's when you need that instant push in life. Ajahn normally turns a candle magic order around within 24 hours. And um, so this and just look at the left. Yeah. Like, yeah. what's the next step there? Does he roll with that um, substance in it? Does he roll yeah. the paper around the wax and then dip it again in wax? No, that, that's the wick. Oh, it so is too. Okay. On the candle... And um, there will be a certain amount of threads within that wick, which usually comes from a, a Buddhist wat, or okay. it's been used in funerals, or to pull a coffin, which makes it a prayer candle. Or in this case, I think this was used just as sicin around the wat. Yeah, and it will there will be a, it will demand a certain amount of cords within it, depending what it's for. It's a health candle, so also the length is part of the witch hat as well that one runs is that big on a giant's body right there are certain measurements in the body that can be measured on his arm and that's how long he, the witcher will say that particular candle is yeah 
but um, the, I forget the name of the I forget the name of the saint. But in the 1100s outside Oxford, this, we mm -hmm. did this work in the um, in a premium member course. But a, a father he, he had a sick daughter. Um, forget it was a female saint. It'll come to me in a minute. But in an attempt to get the saint to heal her, he actually, and this was like measuring was a uh, was a part of saintly folk magic that you would actually measure the exact height of like your child if he or she was sick. And that right. would go into the petition because it's funny, especially for pre-literate people, the only child in the world that is exactly that height is yours, right? Like at that moment. And so it has that same ancient logic of your body or the body that you are in at the time or what have you is somehow incorporated into it like that kind of like language of measurements but it's kind of funny like string measurement of body parts itself is uh is more universal i think than people realize yeah. it's also i mean the fascinating thing here i ask i mean adan's got books of this stuff he collects it he collects old witcher or the witcher from the old masters and I said, how old is candle magic? He said, all of it is pre-Buddhist. Yeah. And it's not, he said, it's basically not been changed for thousands of years. So anything that would have affected somebody in the original cultures, there is candle magic for. The last job we did was a gentleman who uses it quite, quite often. Um, and this week is a very pivotal week because he might be getting a new very well-paid job. So we did two candles for that, and we'll find out whether we got it on Friday. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I mean, but that's how to use it. This is like this is not like talismanic magic that can stay with you for your life. This is the quick punch, the quick no. push when you need it. Very cool. Very cool. So <clears throat> one of the other things that uh, – this is just another comparison that I thought was really interesting from my perspective, because at the moment I'm working on a, actually the next Scarlet Imprint book, but also a presentation I'm giving at a conference in a couple of weeks on cunning traditions. And um, Tasmania has as Australia, which I've looked at, Australia's only kind of like cunning book um, because it was, um, well, it was English for a long time for a start, but also we have two thirds of the remaining Georgian and Victorian um, building stock left in the whole country um, because nothing's really happened down here <laughs> in the last 150 years, right? And so we have all the like the witches' marks and all that kind of stuff down here, and boots in the wall, that kind of thing. Nice. And so going back in my um, sort of library of kind of cunning history stuff, and Owen Davies wrote a book about 20 years ago, which is like the defining book on the um, subject, and mm -hmm. was sort of looking at how. And this is, I think, a bigger universal than people realize. The cunning tradition in Britain <clears throat> survived more than half a millennia. The rise, of, and I would argue fall, but like through the rise of science, through like through Henry VIII and, and the rise of Anglicanism and the rise of science, it stuck around and it was more popular than ever in the Victorian era when you think the opposite. And what killed it in the early 20th century, according to Owen Davies, and I think he's right, is people stopped believing that they needed counter witchcraft measures they they stopped believing they need countermeasures in the early 20th century people still needed like herbal simples and and what have you but the mm. the stock and trade for the cunning man or woman was bewitching or unbewitching rather right like was to dewitch your self or your cattle or whatever it happened to be and, uh, and it was kind of interesting in the book that, like, much of Burmese and Taiya magic is either to heal or counter spells that are afflicting a person, right? Yeah. So it's another one of those universes which I would argue to our um, detriment, we decided universally isn't needed or wasn't there. <laughs> and the rest of the world was never that stupid, right? Like, we just, in the early 20th century, was like, oh, I don't think this stuff happens anymore, therefore it doesn't. But it does. <laughs> it's going to come back. Yeah, I think so. I think it is on the way back. But I think that is the what I'm working on in the presentation at the moment is kind of like where it, what happened and, and where it, it went. Uh, in a, the presentation I, mean, I gave you. Yeah, you go on, sorry. In many ways, the same thing's happening here because of the um, changing society and everything else. We're in almost a generation away now from the height of what can be considered as tire cultism. And, and Buddhist magic, 
yeah but the slightest nudge straight back there it's still yeah. very close to the surface so i think the coming problems are going to be very helpful in many respects to allowing the monks and the lay magicians to practice in in the open again yeah, cool. yeah because people are really going to need all the help they can get at some point or another because like everywhere else the the politicians here are not great and um and it's beyond and the changes are coming so quickly it's beyond the intelligence of 99.99 percent of people how the hell to do to avoid it so people are just going to turn to magic again i think so i think that happened that happened that will happen everywhere um, mm. in that broader definition of magic like we've just seen the the collapse the total collapse in the reputation of allopathic medicine around the world and all the mm. rest of it it's kind of like well what what happens then because people still get sick is um other healing modalities come back and and and, and come back to the surface and i think that's yeah. well, i think the greatest healing healing modality at the moment is to get yourself really fit at this time <laughs> because <laughs> we're gonna need it you know, we're yeah. going to need that physicality here. And it's what I've spent the last year working on, amongst other things, because, you know, we've been from your influence and then looking through a Jan Apichai, and we've been looking at exactly the same uh, concordant futures. That's probably the best yeah. way to, to look at it. And to actually, there's, we should talk about that. There's stuff coming up now, according to um, a Jan Apichai, right? Well, we're in a month where this, I mean, this month I've actually to be quite good, but weirdly, last week, there was a week in this month where everything just stopped business wise. It just, there was nothing happened. It's like, what the fuck's going on? And it was one of those things that um, uh, was, he said this month, uh, it'll, it'll drop. Things right. it come, it will drop. And it's just going down slowly, slowly, slowly in ticks, you know. And also we've got, of course, we've got um, Mercury retrograde coming just to throw a bit more communica communication chaos in there. And September is a definite dum. Yeah. The next I one is November, which is a definite dum, you know. Yeah. And, and in, uh, in particular, early September, right? Like between now and September 9th. From uh, between, yeah, well, September, between now and September 10, I doubt that is. Okay. Yeah. yeah, which again, uh, like I, I'll show, I was telling you before we went live, this is from mm -hmm. Martin Armstrong's private blog, so nobody tell him. Um, this is from the the volatility should rise next week, which is say last week, and the turning point is most, li most likely to unfold the week of August 29th. So it's like beware of September. So it's basically beginning of September, um, same model. I don't like what the array is projecting, and this is more for like international wars. So stuff can happen now that leads to. Um, increasing conflict next year, um, the, the drastic spike in 2023, which you can kind of see here. Um, but there's a couple of them that are financial specific, but um, deep concern is August, September, 2022. Uh, and then September, January, as well as the October, November's time slot. So it's like, it looks very similar. <laughs> uh, my, dad, my dad has November, he's really worried about November. Me I mean, he, as he said, um, it's just a house of cards. Yep. And it's really, really difficult to forecast exactly when this is going to happen. So he's just saying, I'm worried about November and the first two months of next year is a fucking disaster. Yes, that's exactly. So that's November and Q1 of next year, um, we, we get some kind of crazy ass fucking wobble um, now, but November and Q1 of next year are... Uh, Right. <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. going to get difficult, but you know, we're getting used to this now. I think, in some respects, and we're getting you because you know, when people listen to this, they'll be like, "Oh, you know," no, it's not, yeah. we're going to get depressed. But there's no time for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this, also, like, it's better to know than not, right? Like Armstrong's thing is like, if I tell you I'm going to punch you before I do it, then like. You've got on the way <laughs> <laughs> this is good news idiots um, yeah. it's not yeah it's it, you know the the worst thing to do is to be like tra la la can't wait for 2019 to come back like not <laughs> it's not gonna happen the rest of this decade is a problem 
Yeah. You know? And I think anybody, everybody can see it, whether you're actually acknowledging acknowledging it or not, it's up to you. Yeah. Um, because none of us, no, nobody likes change, and the change is coming so quickly that yeah. it's terrifying. You know, every month there are huge changes going on. And even when some changes like, you know, that if they'd have happened five years ago, there would have been a worldwide demonstrations. Like suddenly, I think it was a few weeks ago, one of the scientists that announced that we now can't drink rainwater. Yeah. And it just didn't even make a ripple out there because there's that much other stuff going on, you know. It's people are in kind of fight or flight mode constantly, which is where the mental illnesses are coming from as well. And the stress levels are coming from. And you pile on top of that a bit of Mars and Saturn and a bit of Uranus. And it's not going to get any better. No, agreed. Um, not for a while, but like the, the thing I always tell people is that you came here for these times. So, yeah. Like, do them right that's the thing and i think that's a big part of i mean i know we were hitting talking about it before i hit record that um you guys over there are aware of it too and it's one of the reasons for even a kind of like a more international facing for making amulets available and the rest of it and particular kinds of amulets and and so on so that uh because particularly for the the astrological troubles an amulet is a really good thing to smooth the the rush the rough edges right of of uh of the malefic that's what we're looking to do with everything really that's i mean that's what we look to do as people we look to try and move forward without smacking our head against the wall yeah but the other thing actually the other interesting thing is actually what's gone on in thailand as a whole this year because there's obviously people close to the government that's advising them because they're a bit useless this lot and you look at the changes they've made within the society they've suddenly decriminalized cannabis to try and bring money in yeah they're doing uh, next will be um legalizing same-sex marriage which is just so slow at, you know um, and slowly but surely they're bringing in things, they're just bringing in a new type of visa for rich people. They're liberalising <clears throat> as fast as they can do it when you're an, an ageing old general, yeah? And which is still not that fast, but you know what I mean? They're, <laughs> they're making the effort to try and keep the country running in some way because they have an idea of what's coming. They're letting the Russians in as well, you know, but yeah. they probably don't try and keep them on Phuket. And that's fine. Yeah. Everybody needs a holiday somewhere, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, this is not the people, man. This is generally yeah. the state apparatus that's causing these problems. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it's you know the they can react quite quickly here and change things quite quickly. Whereas in most countries, they, they just got they're just covering their head with a bunker or whatever. Yeah. You know, they're not changing with it. We've got to adapt. And you've got to get a good idea is also to kind of instill change naturally quickly in your life. Change your diet tomorrow. Yeah. Change, change the whole layout of your house. Move your bed in a different direction. These are all natural ways to combat things like Rahu to help with Saturn as well because they are demanding change. And if we resist changes, we'll get hurt. I like it. I like it. And it, it well, all helps. Yeah. Well, uh, where do people go to get the book? I, I would jump to it online, but it's not technically up yet. <laughs> oh, up later today. We're trying to work out this problem with um, uh, Kindle because it just kind of uploads each page as a photograph, so you've got to kind of mess around. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah, yeah, we can't work it out. We're going to have a look at it today, but cool. I've got a, a John Dewey's coming down later because we're going to go and photograph him sat next to a tiger, seeing as he's a tiger, a John, and do an Quite interview enough today about um you know the curses they do here there's an interview going in the book about something i've always 
suspected Matt exists, but we haven't got any evidence of it. And he's doing an interview about the curses that the Ajans use on other magicians. Cool. They're not available yeah. to um, the general public because of the toll it takes on the karmic body. But when a magician first enters the system, they normally have to um, defend themselves and attack other Ajans, other magicians, until things settle down, until they get used to somebody else being in there. Because we, we know of a few Ajans here who have killed people, and it's often other magicians who have not listened to sense and been told not to do it, and they continue. So that should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. That'll so it might be in the next day or so then, but um, it will be the com or the Tyacult Facebook page? Um, you'll be able to get it at um, the com. It'll be Excellent. on the front page. We might do it later on tonight and still keep pottering around. I might wait to upload the thing on uh, Amazon. Because no, that's there's fine. Been quite a few You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's quite a few updates this month because of extra work we're doing. I basically yeah. decided to release it quicker. Uh, and this is PDF only because we're going to up continually update this. It is too complicated to try and make as a, sim as a single book in one go yeah <clears throat> we have to leave gaps between between uh, interviewing the same people yeah. and this arose particularly with uh, kruba apiwat which uh, you might want to mention shortly i don't know because his magic is so complicated that you have to leave time between each subject otherwise it all starts to sound the same right. whereas leaving time brings a fresh perspective to the questions and to what he's going to say. Cool. And so that means basically if you're listening to this, because I'll probably, I'll post the the show more widely, I guess, tomorrow my time. Okay. Um, but whenever it's available, um, buy it because you won't miss out on anything. Um, people who buy it will get updates. For um, free, you'll be updated. Yeah. One at the end of September, October and November for a start off. Cool. So it's yeah. a living book. That that's, it's that's living book. Thing. When yeah. it's finished, it will be printed by a reputable company. Awesome. awesome. That's waiting in the wings. But I'm also having to cover the cost with this because you don't get any money out of these people. It's a proper company. Books don't make money. I'm you know, aware. I spent three thousand dollars already on this one. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm aware. So everyone, go out and buy the fucking living PDF. That's an order. It's really good. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't shill it if it wasn't, but I've already got a bunch of stuff, particularly around the incense, because I have so many joss sticks. And now I have a reason because I, I feel um, <laughs> profligate or wasteful using a bunch of them at once. And now I have a reason <laughs> to try well, different numbers of them. Joss sticks is that they can supply um, things for talismans. Yes. Yeah. Because if a joystick is used for wishes or for requests, the, it adds um, magic to the remains of the joystick. Um, like I've been asked on various occasions by the Ajans down here just to collect some joystick powder from famous ghost shrines in Bangkok in particular, because it becomes like a, a pry joystick almost, yeah. a burnt joystick, you know, with the wishes attached to it. Very nice. Well, um, yeah, these are always, you know, I was, I was going to say it's been too long, but uh, it, <laughs> it's been quite recent. But I love these chats. Everyone else does. Um, it's always exciting to hear what the hell's going on with you and what's going on with Thailand. And uh, and I learn so much each time we have these chats. So thank you so it's, much. It's fun. It's yeah, always absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And people listening, tyacult.com, the tyacult.com. Go and uh, go and grab this PDF. It's really, really good. You've seen some of it in the video. If you're listening to it, there's a few slides in the video. You can jump over and have a look. But otherwise, check it out. Thank you very much, God.